All right. Get our game up on the board and let's get back to the, uh, the eternal art of making friends. <laughs> All right. See it. There we go. Hmm. Alright, so we've been getting along, getting on, moving on. I believe we're in 14. We had talked to Arsty and had not met the other friend on the other side. This is a dark world, both because it's night and because of the brutal struggle for survival among its polyhemocratic inhabitants many of whom seem to thrive on havoc and carnage. You'd be interested to see the Michelin Guide entry for Alternia. You're convinced that after a day here, Ayn Rand would sign up with the Little Sisters of the Poor, Genghis Khan and Attila the Han would join the Quakers, and Adolf Hitler would seek membership in the World Peace Council. Godwin, Godwin's Law Alert! Getting a little dramatic tonight. All right. Gotta go. Get off. <laughs> Having learned the dangers of using the public thoroughfares, you've taken to dodging down byways and skulking in rear areas, trying to spy out individuals who look ripe for friendship, while avoiding the more criminally insane denizens. Just now, you're following a winding footpath through the undergrowth surrounding a neighborhood where the local hives are spaced far apart. Hmm. <laughs> you came creeping along this footpath for safety. You should have known better. The undergrowth here is like most of the other life forms in Alternia evolved to ruthlessly purge the gene pool of the weak and the reasonable. Coiled, spring-loaded stalks with foot-long thorns flank writhing bushes with razor-edged leaves, which in turn crowd tentacled flora with toothed lobes, oozing liquid that hisses and smokes when it touches the ground. Extreme caution is needed, just as it's needed in every circumstance on this planet. While your time on Alternia has gotten you accustomed to injuries, you still shrink from being impaled on sprung thorns and dissolved into acid. You should have known that eventually you would have, have to come up against the local flora. So you proceed discreetly, avoiding pro poison fronds and trying not to step on trigger roots. But suddenly your vegetative focus is interrupted. You hear footsteps on the path and then around the corner comes a small figure. Its face and horns are painted with smudge black and white marks. Despite its diminutive physique, it has some of the most impressive horns you've seen on any troll. Then the small figure sees you too, and is so startled it jumps a foot, impaling its horns in an overhanging tree branch and sticking there so that its small legs pump helplessly in the air. <clears throat> you beg the small person's pardon, and assure him that you are fully as startled as he. You go on to explain that you're not dangerous, but that even if you were, you would not want to come to strife with even a small person with horns of that size. Unk? Yes, you will be happy to help him down, as long as he promises not to attack you with the many bladed weapons that are stuffed into his belt, or with a dozen cans of an inexpensive soft drink held in bandoliers crossing his chest. It strikes you suddenly that a neighborly gesture like helping someone whose horns are stuck in a tree branch can scarcely fail to kindle the light of friendship. You dare to hope that this will be the case now. Edging forward, you get close enough to see that around the small clown's neck hangs a dog tag or ID necklace. You tilt your head and crane your neck to read the writing on it. Karako Piero. If lost, call Bronya or Sama. Oh, we know Bronya. One second. Oh. All right. Suddenly this all makes sense. This Caraco Piero must have been one of Bronya's reject runt wrigglers, who, having grown to childhood under her tender care, has gone out into the world to seek his fortune. That would account for his small size, short legs, and small stature relative to his horns. You eagerly pull out your palm husk, happy for an excuse to pester your old friend, but you've got zero signal out here. You wonder if the surrounding vegetation eats palm husk signals, just as it looks like it eats everything else. You disappointedly slip your palm husk back into your pocket. Honk. You apologize for the delay, explaining that you were surprised to find that you appear to have an acquaintance in common, whom you hope you will have time to discuss later. For now you are ready, willing, and hopefully able to help him down. You hope he won't be offended if you slip behind him first. 
It's not that you object to bladed weapons or those who stuff dozens of them in their belts, but you feel that the ones he's wearing could ruin your look if buried in your torso, however unintentionally. You edge past the weapons, being careful also not to touch the spring thorns growing at the edge of the path or their trigger roots. Once you're behind Carico, you grasp his horns firmly and pull, withdrawing them from the tree branch and allowing him to drop lightly to the ground. Ugh. You tell him that he's very welcome, and there's a moment of awkward silence as you try to think of something else to say. Fortunately, your new potential friend is not as devoid of his social graces as you are, and gets the conversational ball rolling himself. Ugh. You explain that you are indeed a stranger in these parts, and that you actually don't fit into any of the hemospectrum categories. Wild, right? Although not quite as strange as you used to be, you like to think. You're really starting to blend in with the local color. Ah? Um, well, you'd rather not exhibit your blood just now. You're a couple quarts low due to the robust conditions of life on Alternia, some of which you have recently had the honor of encountering. Ah? You sympathize. Slinking along these hidden paths in the Alternian woods can be tough on the morale. The smell alone is enough to make strong men weep, and the vegetation looks like it was designed by the Marquis de Sade. Uh, not that he knows who the Marquis de Sade is. You can't help but feel that it would be so much better if, if one only had a skulk buddy, you continue. How wonderful it would be to travel these dusky lanes with a kindred spirit, a twin soul, a fellow traveler, an intimate crony. You're such an expert on friend synonyms by now. Ankh? No, you haven't met anyone like that either, but you would certainly like to. Your new potential friend is obviously thinking seriously about this issue, so you back off and give him space. You pretend to be deeply immersed in studying one of the razor-sharp leaves on one of the writhing bushes beside the path. You aren't one to force yourself on others, or try to unduly influence their friendship decisions. Okay, well, maybe you forced yourself on others in the past and tried to influence their friendship decisions. Maybe you've even done this a lot, but you've recently evolved as a person. You now know that friendship is something that has to come authentically from within. Friendship is spontaneous. Real friendship sprouts naturally from the soil of mutual respect. The best friendships grow and ripen over years and are not rushed or forced. Of course, you've only known this small person for about five minutes, but you have to start ripening sometime. You're reflecting thus on the theme of friendship when a loud <laughs> pours suddenly from the sky above you. It's a crackling, sizzling sound like a chitinous thing with too many legs struggling in a hot frying pan. Carico jumps so violently that he nearly gets his horn stuck in the tree again. Looking up, you see a floating metal object, vaguely troll-shaped, but huge, faceless, metal, and with numerous sets of lightning bolt-shaped horns coming out of its head and neck. It's also not a very sparkling conversationalist. Scratch! It remarks in a flat, echoing blare. Scratch! It elaborates further. Ank! Run the drone. Or leap to their aid. Uh, let's leap to their aid. That sounds suitably self-destructive. <laughs> you leap to your protofen's aid. Thinking quickly, you push Karako against a large rock that juts out of the undergrowth nearby and jump in front of him, shielding him from the drone with your body. You then pretend to be leaning against the rock in an attitude of tranquil repose. Several of the bladed weapons in Karako's belt poke you in the ass, but you don't let this show on your face. Instead, you yawn elaborately and check your wristwatch. You don't have a wristwatch, but you don't think drones know what a wristwatch is anyway. You pretend to smoke a non-existent cigarette. Again, you're not giving anything away, because drones don't know what cigarettes are either. But the drone has apparently taken an interest in you. It floats down between the trees and undergrowth, and hovers above the path several meters from where you're pretending to relax against a rock after a long day of hiking through scenic shit-smell forest. It's quite the terrifying sight, actually. Squish! The drone observes soullessly, making Carico jump so that several of your internal organs are threatened. However, you maintain what you believe the local populace would call a stip upper whistle pillow. The drone's blank metal head studies you. Or it could be studying something in the opposite direction, or even taking the drone equivalent of a piss. You can't really tell from its expression because it has no features to make expressions with. This examination, or non examination, continues for some time. But your diminutive potential friend is well hidden from view, and after a while, evidently concluding that you're an inanimate object that makes unaccountable gestures with its wrists and fingers, 
The drone floats upward again, gaining speed, until, with a dreary scrrr, it, it whizzes off somewhere to find other hapless, non-standard citizens to euthanize. When it's gone, you stand away from the rock and rub several source places that have been pierced by bladed weapons. You turn to Karako to comment on the recent fervor, but stop when you see the look he is directing at you. A warm and admiring look. An affectionate and esteeming look. A look of friendship. Your first impulse is to throw your arms around him and lean in, but on second thought, remembering his pants arsenal, you put out your hand for a warm handshake. Victory is so close. But before you can seal the deal on this sweet friendship transaction, you hear a disturbance further down the path. God, can't the narrative chill for one single moment? Especially a moment when you're about to consummate a beautiful friendship. You turn to look. The footsteps, several sets of them, get nearer, and around the bend come three figures. Three figures wearing swimming outfits, lots of gold jewelry, and insouciant expressions. Three figures with gills on their necks and small, stylized fins on their face. Oh man, is it possible that you finally happened upon a group of the legendary Sea Dwellers? They stop short when they see you and Carico, obviously startled. They study you, you study them. Then Finhead Interlover 1, in a one piece and diamond earrings, whispers to her companions and all three burst out laughing. Finhead Interloper 2, in a violet wetsuit and rings, slaps her thigh, and Finhead Interloper 3, in checkered swimming trunks, holds his sides. Part of you is relieved. Laughter drives out the devil, is the best medicine, and in any event is better than homicidal mania. On the other hand, this laughter isn't friendly, it's cold, mocking and supercilious. These sea dwellers are obviously laughing at you, not with you. You notice Karako's cheeks flushing purple under his face paint, and his jaws clenching. However, he just stares with stony dignity at the interlopers. This just makes them laugh harder. The first sea, the first sea dweller says, What are you two supposed to be? Trim Cassidy and the squamous kid, says her second companion. Colbate Minnow and his mutated softshell crab, says her third. Looks like the Minnow Minimal one went down on the clown, causing it to spurt out the other one. The sea dweller's laughter is redoubled. You continue expressionless at these insults, but to your dismay, Karako's face is taking on a harsh, glowering look. You guess that such a tiny dude has probably been victimized by bullies his whole life. And, as you happen to know, there are no bullies like Alternian bullies. Honk. You tell him to let them talk all the shit they want. Don't let them provoke him. They're trying to get him to do something stupid. If he doesn't react, they'll get bored and go away. Honk. No, remember that drone. It's probably still around here somewhere. Touch a scale on their heads and you could be rendered into mother grub feedstock. Hey bottom feeders, no whispering when you're in the presence of your bathers. And you, little boy, put a respectful expression on your recognition surface. Be more like your friend, the slender manatee over there. In fact, why is it you two are still perpendicular? In the presence of sea dwellers, you should be bowed at rye anglers. The first sea dweller seems to have an affinity for cheesy ocean ponds. You bow to the Sea Dwellers. You have your dignity, but you also like not getting killed. Karako remains stubbornly upright, his face getting angrier and purpler by the moment. The bladed weapons in his belt jingle from his enraged trembling. Oh, see the little clownfish. He's getting angry. Looks like he's gonna shit his pants. What did I tell you about your face, boy? Didn't your Lucis teach you anything? I doubt he even has a Lucis. Self-respecting Lucis would never let a shrimp like that out of the hive. Unless this Lucis is just as defective. The Lucis cracks are too much for Karako. Ignoring your hissed warnings, he suddenly leaps, snarling into the air, draws bladed weapons from his belt in, his ha in each hand, and hurtles toward the sea dwellers. Honk! Honk! <laughs> oh dear. Alright, let's, uh. Grab him by the. Coach tails and try to keep him from precipitating a disaster? You leap forward and grab Karako by the coattails. Or by his belt. You aren't actually sure what a coattail is. Jesus, he's strong. You can barely hold him. It's like trying to restrain a small truck. His legs rotate wildly, kicking up a cloud of dust, and he brandishes his bladed weapons wildly in the direction of the sea dwellers. After a startled moment in which they jump backward, the sea dwellers have started to laugh again, coming up with more stupid insults and fish puns. This is not helping. 
Eriko runs twice as hard, honks twice as loud, shakes his weapons twice as threateningly. Hey, hey, you shouted Kariko, trying to be heard above the fracas, holding on with all your might and digging in your heels. You have half a mind to just let him go, to pay the sea dwellers back for their insults. But you try to keep a cool head. You're doing your proto-friend much more good trying to restrain his wrath. Really? You've now succeeded in wrapping your arms all the way around him, and now you get in front of him, holding him back with straight arms, bellowing soothingly into his face and trying to avoid the bladed weapons he's brandishing. It's not working. Yeah, you can see from the contorted features, the bared teeth, the distended nostrils with smoke coming out, the blazing eyes, that Carico is getting more and more enraged. And suddenly his rage seems to reach a kindling point. His body vibrates violently, his eyes grow huge and round. And suddenly from his body, something like a nuclear blast, pressure wave fear of... Hmm. Like a nuclear blast, pressure wave of fear and violence sends you flying through the air like a scrap of paper in a gale. What the fuck? Are you hallucinating? But you can see as you soar up above the path that the sea dwellers aren't laughing anymore. In fact, they're screaming in terror and fleeing wildly, blundering into razor leaves, being impaled by spring thorns and burned by pod acid, and generally receiving the stern retribution that awaits assholes. Then your head collides with a tree branch, and you're rendered unable to narrate for a while. Hmm. 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 You wake up lying in the dust. As consciousness returns, you realize that you're lying on the path, and it as it returns further, that a small, clown-painted figure is seated next to you. Right, calm. He smiles fondly as he sees you sit up. Hank. You smile in return. You express relief that he realizes that you were acting in his best interest, holding him back from the finheads. And now, though largely because of his unexpected burst of clown sorcery, or whatever that was, everything has turned out for the best. Carico holds up his arms for a hug, but then remembering the bladed weapons in his belt, sticks out his hand. You shake it warmly. Alright. <laughs> One second here. Oof. <laughs> Just had to secure that door again. Okay. Let's be a little less, uh, <laughs> a little less competent. <laughs> All right. What happens if we just tell him to run? You run in wild panic. It's a drone. Even the Alternian badasses you've hung out with have been terrified of the drones. Up close, it's one of the most terrifying things you've ever seen, and it's making noises, which you didn't even know they even did, and which probably means something sinister. You race at top speed down the twisting path, focusing your senses to their breaking point to avoid trigger roots, razor leaves, and acid pods. At first you hear the pattering of small feet running behind you, but as you redouble your speed, the pattering falls back, and after a while is lost in the distance. You sprint for what seems a lifetime before you finally catch your foot on a trigger root and go flying through the air, barely missing being sliced into a hundred pieces of tumbling ham by the barbed spring vine that lashes across the path only inches behind you. You land in the dirt, wind knocked out of you, but otherwise unhurt. You lie there catching your breath and waiting, but nothing happens. No enormous metal monster whizzes down the path to impale you. No small clown-faced individual overtakes you on his short legs. Finally, after enough nothing happens, you pick yourself up and dust yourself off. You're alone on the path, and no sound of either friend or potential friend or foe can be heard. No birds sing, which is probably good. You imagine that any birds native to this forest would probably sing by croaking up putrid sludge, and that the sludge would be poisonous or radioactive. But leaving aside the character of the local fauna, what should you do? Keep on down the path, putting more distance between yourself and the drone? Or should you go back and see if Karako is okay? You waffle for a while, then decide to go back. You sneak back along the path. You sneak a long, long way. But however far you go, there are no signs of either Karako or the drone. 
You don't know whether the drone picked Karako up and took him away, or disemboweled him and scattered the fragments, or whether Karako leapt into the undergrowth and hid or escaped, or what. One way or another, you're all alone again on this path through Shit Smell Forest. Game over. <laughs> Dark world. Okay. Leap to their aid. And then we'll leap into the fray. You leap into the fray to lend comfort and support. You would have counseled Karako to turn the other cheek, and keep turning cheek after cheek until the sea dwellers got fed up and went away, but now that things have hotted up, you're not about to let down the side. Karako crashes into the sea dwellers, his bladed weapons whirling like a blender. You scamper close behind him and kick someone in the shin. It hurts your foot, but doesn't seem to have any other effect. These sea dwellers are made of tough stuff. Or you are extremely flimsy. Signs have recently pointed to the latter. More than just recently. <laughs> Your next sortie is more effective, however. Thinking quickly, you pick up a rock and throw it at the trigger root of a springthorn going along the path, next to where the violet bloods are enduring Hurricane Clown. The coiled stalk springs out, impaling the dude with a dozen foot-long thorns. He's thrown off balance, and violet blood begins to flow copi copiously down his body. That's a hue you haven't seen before. Hmm, kinda pretty. These sea dwellers are made of tough stuff. He yanks the spring thorn stalk away from him, pulling the thorns out, and flings it into the woods. Then he takes out a pocket handkerchief and starts patting his injuries gently. Meanwhile, Karako's bladed weapons have not been idle, and the other two sea dwellers are likewise leaking violet blood. But these bastards are hard to kill. You remember Palapa telling you that. As you watch, one of them grabs one of the bladed weapons from Karako's hand and buries it in Karako's stomach. This, unsurprisingly, is distracting for a poor little clown, allowing two of the finny sons of bitches to grab handfuls of bladed weapons from his belt and bury them in various parts of his body. You dance around, delivering harmless kicks and curses. Karako is still waving his weapons, but he seems to be waving them more slowly now. Then, as more and more bladed weapons are buried in his body, he seems to lose focus. The weapons he's been brandishing fall from his hands. Finally, he falls to the ground in the center of a spreading pool of purple blood, twitches feebly for a minute, and then is still. You stare in disbelief at the corpse of one who, if he had been spared just a short while longer, would have been your friend. One despised and rejected. A clown of suffering, familiar with pain. Religious references here. They had flogged him, and mocked him, and spit on him, and then killed him. You struggle to come to terms with this. You're doing that, one of the remaining sea dwellers grabs you by the hair and suplexes you out of, onto the ground. Your head snaps back and pain explodes behind your eyes. You're left lying on your back and trying to stay conscious, which is why you have a good view of what happens next. In the dark sky above you, something opens, something even darker than the sky, a hole like a cave in the clouds. It widens until you can see that in the cave, a carousel with wooden horses mounted on vast posts rotates. The horse is plunging up and down in time with carnival music, played by a mechanical organ. organ. Riding the horses are naked store window mannequins, their legs slung awkwardly over the horses' backs, their stiff arms down by their side in whatever pose they were created, their horns huge and wildly shaped. In the darkness above the carousel, other naked mannequins with plastic wings tied to their backs are supported on wires. And above these, in turn, a net of white Christmas tree lights twinkle against the roof of the dark cave, or circus tent, or whatever it is, throwing the dim starlight illumination down on the rotating carousel. As you watch, two of the winged mannequins break loose from their wires and fly down from their dark region into the night sky in the dimension Alternia occupies. They maneuver until the stiff hands on the ends of their stiff arms are underneath Carico, and then they lift him up into the sky and into the dark carnival. You hear a last faint reviving honk as they set him on one of the wooden horses, and then the hole in the sky closes, and there's nothing but the night sky above you. All is silent and still again. 
an odd feeling comes over you. You don't think you've ever felt such a feeling. Just the reality of how utterly insignificant you are. Sure, you spent the last few months wandering with no desire but the desire for connection, and you are, in a way, a being unique in this galaxy. But honestly, what does that even mean? You flit in and out of people's lives, there one minute, gone the next, always moving from friend to friend. You are, for all intents and purposes, a virtual non-entity, a bland point-of-view vector, a neutral second-person narrator, barely coming into the picture, a retiring entity, expressing only a simple, one-dimensional desire for friendship. But just about now, you feel that things have gone pretty far. And just about now, you feel that you've had about enough. Enough of arrogant high-bloods. Enough, in fact, of this of short wavelength hemotypes carelessly and without compunction killing and maiming and exploding those of longer wavelengths, of a survival of the fittest regime that seems to come to, down to survival of the most violent psychopath. Is this a moral universe or is it not, you ask yourself? Are repulsive cruelty and sickening evil punished in this universe or are they not? Does an ethical force operate in this universe or does it not? You don't know the answer to these questions, but you do know one thing. You intend to depart for once from your one-dimensional persona. You intend to punish repulsive cruelty and sickening evil if it comes within your ability to do so. You intend to create an ethical force field in your local region. You intend to exert some moral gravity right around where you are, if you possibly can. And you realize that this odd feeling you're having seems to be drawing moral Higgs bosons out of the moral ground state and right out of the fabric of this multicolored blood-soaked planet that heaves under your feet. You take on the abs aspect of Clown Sarker. Seizing two cans of inexpensive soft drink from where they fell from Caraco's bandoliers, you shake them and pull the pins. Then, with malice aforethought, you direct the twin streams at the sea dwellers. You smell banana and strawberry as the deadly streams play upon them. Already weakened, they fall back with cries under the withering onslaught. As soon as the streams slacken, you take up two more cans, shake them, and deal out death to the unrighteous. You smell peach and diet root beer this time, but no pity softens your heart. You wouldn't care even if it were pineapple watermelon you were spraying on these brutes. But these finheads are made of tons of tough stuff. Rallying even in the face of this intense onslaught, they push forward and, seizing some bladed weapons from the purple blood pool, advance upon you. Not one step back, you vow to the memory of Caraco Pierrot. You stand your ground in desperation, grabbing some cans of diet tonic water and club soda, and opening up your batteries once again, but to no avail. A trident pierces you to the bone, followed by a scimitar, a tomahawk, a short spear, and so many other bladed weapons that the sheer weight of them drives you to the ground, where your red, precious blood flows in moderate streams, mixing with the purple blood of your proto-friend. This is the end, you realize, but you're glad you died in righteous battle. You're glad you created even the tiny, sputtering, temporary moral force field in your local region that you did. You can feel your life and narrative point of view slipping away, but you're content. Yet, what's that you see above you now? A dark space has opened up, darker than the night sky, and two stiff-looking winged figures are descending. They land next to you and gently place their stiff hands under you. And they ascend once again, lifting you higher and higher into the dark space. As you pass the boundary of the heavenly carnival, your life seems to revive within you, and as the fabric of the place closes around you, and the two stiff mannequins place you on a car carousel horse next to Carico, you realize that planets, universes, dimensions, realities, powers, principalities, and cosmos come and go, but friendship is forever. Friendship. <laughs> wow!